Welcome to this global webinar series on strengthening budget credibility through external audits. My name is Aranza Zubilla Montero, and I have the pleasure to moderate the virtual session today. We are delighted to be together for today's session on advancing budget credibility through external audits, impact, and strategic considerations. This is the fourth and the last session of the webinar series. And the session today is organized by the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, and the International Budget Partnership, IBP, in collaboration with the US Government Accountability Office, DAO, and the Intosai Development Initiative, IDI. And we would like to thank our partners, IDI and GAO, for their collaboration in this session. The webinar series follows the launching of a strengthening budget credibility through external audits, an auditor's handbook. The handbook explores different approaches to auditing budget credibility and provides a practical overview of existing and potential audit work that can contribute to improving budget credibility. The handbook also aims to support supreme audit institutions in enhancing their analysis of the credibility of government budgets. I would like to announce that an advanced and edited version of the French translation of the full handbook is now available in both IBP and UNDESA's website. And you can find the links uh, to the English version and the French version in the chat. Also, we have uh, published a short pocket version of the handbook, which is a first introduction to some of the key messages and the themes that you can find in the longer version of the, of the handbook. The event today will be conducted in English and will be recorded, and we will be sharing a recording with all the registrants after the session. I would like to invite all the participants in the audience to actively engage in the discussion today by using the chat to introduce yourselves, your institution, your country, and please to share your experiences, reflections, questions, and comments. And we will have time during the panel uh, discussion to ask your questions and your concerns to our panelists and to get their insight. So let's begin today's session. Supreme audit institutions play a crucial role in strengthening the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, and ensuring that a country's budget is on track. External audits help assess the ability of governments to meet their expenditure and revenue targets accurately and consistently. Systematic monitoring and follow-up to audit recommendations and engaging with relevant stakeholders can further amplify the impact of external audits to address budget credibility issues. The session today will focus on how to advance audit work on budget credibility and enhance its impact. It will consider the different ways in which the impact of audits related to budget credibility could be strengthened, taking into consideration different contexts. The session will highlight the importance of engagement with relevant stakeholders and provide examples and recommendations to advance collaboration around budget credibility. The session will also consider and discuss strategic opportunities to further advance this work, including by linking it to intersize strategic priorities and ongoing work of different size around SDG auditing and financial sustainability. Some of the questions we would like to reflect on today include how can external audits contribute to enhance the credibility of government budgets? What are some of the key challenges for supreme audit institutions and potential solutions and ways to address these challenges? What are the examples of the specific impacts of audits on improving public financial management and budget credibility? How can supreme audit institutions collaborate with different stakeholders to enhance the impact of audits related to budget credibility? And what are some of the strategic opportunities to further advance the work on supreme audit institutions on budget credibility? And how can these opportunities be leveraged going forward? We will now turn to our panelists and invite them to share their experiences and their reflections in addressing some of these questions. Each speaker will have seven minutes for an initial intervention, and I would like to kindly ask you to be mindful of the time, and of course, we will remind you also when the time is about to, to uh, end. And to our audience, please do continue to use the chat to share your questions, your comments, and your experiences. First, I would like to invite Aníbal Colhuber of the General Audit Office of Argentina, 
to share some insights from chapter seven of the handbook, which Sai Argentina coordinated and focuses on audit impact. Aníbal, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Arantxa. It's a pleasure to be here, to be invited to participate on this, this webinar series, and of course, to be part of the team who were working in the writing of this, this chapter. So for me, it's a very special moment to be here with some colleagues and friends, of course. So I would like to say that the chapter uh, highlights the importance of how to prepare findings, because uh, it's, it's the main issue for us to, not just to communicate, if not to convince to the ODT, what are we talking about? And, and for that, it's, it's very important to see in the chapter how we have some tool, tools and examples and attributes to contract uh, good findings and recommendations. The other thing is, uh, what about the follow-up? The follow-up is, is crucial, as, as you mentioned before, to know how effective is the office, because finally, it's not just to prepare a report, it's, it's to know if we, if we do some changes after the, the construction of the report. Uh, in, the, in the chapter, we can find some examples uh, to systematize or not uh, the findings and the follow-up of these recommendations. And, and of course, many sites are very worried about the percentage of the implementation of the findings and the recommendations. That is a, a very important intersite global staking report to something in 20 that says that uh, the, the percentage of implementation of the recommendation are not so high. So the office are, are very focused on, on how to implement uh, good findings, recommendation, and how to do good follow-up, and what kind of mechanism we can find to, to do the, the implementation real. Uh, of course, we, we can find in this big group of size many kind of situations. For example, one of them have a implementation plan or or they have a, another kind of things like a penalization or, or put some kind of a fine to, to do the implementation to, to be real. So, but for our experience, uh, it's, it's very important how to communicate with the stakeholders because stakeholders make a big uh, impact to do the, the recommendation real, of course, when it, it is necessary. Uh, the chapter suggests some identification of, of key stakeholders, but uh, one of them is the civil society organizations. And we have some examples written in the chapter, but on the other side, I can talk about the experience of Argentina. Uh, in our case, the, the office opened the doors to the CSOs in 2002 as a way to participate in the institutional plan, in the, in the specific plan of the audit. Um, and that, that opening of the doors make a big, big impact to our work. Uh, we have some examples like the case of the Chagas. Chagas is a, is a disease, is a, is a parasite driven infection and after the participation of, of the CSOs, uh, they recommend some issues in the planning phase. They recommend uh, something related to the construction of the findings. And the most important thing is how to do an impact and influence to the ministry to, to put a special interest in this, in this part. Uh, and this is a case of of a success story in terms of uh, that the recommendations were applied, the ministry take consideration, and finally, we have a regulation. Uh, the name of the CSO is ASIG, it's, it's, uh, it's related to equity and justice, so we were very happy to, to have the, the work with us. And we have another examples, of course, related to the uncapability of people, 
the bus transportation, but uh, of course it's a, it's a challenge, but on the other side, we have good results when we have the participation of the civil society organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anibal, uh, for setting uh, some insights from chapter seven. Uh, the Chagas example from Argentina is quite interesting. I encourage all the audience to go to the handbook and check the example, but also we have other experiences and examples, not only in chapter seven, but also through some of the chapters on how uh, some of the work of Supreme Audit institutions on assessing the performance of public financial management systems and processes, or assessing uh, the NDR accounts of governments have had successful impact in different countries and different contexts. So please go and check some of the resources and our colleagues are actually sharing some of them in the chat now. Our next speaker is Jeffrey Arkin, director at the US Government Accountability Office, who will share some insights on how work on budget credibility relates with uh, GAO work on longer term financial health and sustainability. Please, uh, Jeff. Hi, everybody. Uh, so it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you so much for, for participating in this event, in this important event. Um, I'd like to talk about fiscal and budget credibility as it relates to fiscal sustainability, which is uh, really our, a big focus for us at, at GAO. Um, when we think about fiscal sustainability, really what we're talking about is having uh, a fiscal policy where government spending and revenue uh, don't continuously lead to growing debt. Uh, debt has been a challenge for us here and particularly looking at the long term um, what what things will look like in 20 30 years and so on if we continue on the path that we are on now um, we we feel and others here feel that the path uh, that we're on now is, is unsustainable and that um, there's a lot of effort needed to uh, bring some balance with our fiscal policy so debt doesn't rise faster than the economy. Uh, and this has been a, an ongoing challenge for, for us for a number of years. And what we see is some of the risks involved with this, and in particular, how those risks can uh, affect the general public. Um, so for example, if debt continues to accumulate, and um, it has an effect on interest rates that can affect borrowing from the public if you want to borrow to buy a car or to start a business and for businesses who might want to borrow uh, to to invest this, um, higher interest rates can have a negative effect on on wages it can depress an investment and, and can affect the economy overall and that's a situation that we we are hoping to avoid um, and in the worst case scenario, it could it could initiate a fiscal crisis where uh, our our debt becomes unattractive to investors. Um, so what we've really done uh, for, on this topic for for a number of years is we produce an annual report, uh, an audit report, looking at what we call the nation's fiscal health, and we talk about the current fiscal condition. And what that what our uh, our fiscal situation looks like into the future with projections on spending and revenue and really try to illustrate the the situation that will occur in the future if our government doesn't make changes now. Um, we've been doing this work for a while. I think it has been somewhat difficult to get a lot of attention because it is a challenging topic. Um, in order to address it, you'd have to do things that might be unpopular, like raise taxes or cut spending on programs, uh, and, and that can be a difficult sell. Um, so what we've really tried to do is draw attention to the work, um, one, for the public uh, and the media, and, and one way we've tried to do that is to make our audit findings uh, and the reports in which we report them 
a, a little bit easier to access and consume. So more simple language, more graphics, more pictures, shorter products, things that people can engage with. Audit reports aren't always as exciting to read than the story on you know, football or a movie star or something. So how can we make it more attractive to read an audit report about budget credibility or fiscal sustainability? Um, we also really, as Annabelle mentioned, uh, civil uh, society organizations are really important. And we try to work with them to, to amplify our message. They have uh, similar work and similar messages. And so we collaborate closely with them to try to bring as much attention to, to this issue and the challenges involved in, as, as possible. Um, another way, and we talked about recommendations, uh, you know, for an, our situation is a little bit different um, than auditing a particular program because the solutions are in a lot of ways political solutions, uh, which can be difficult for us to address as an audit institution. Um, but that said, we still have made recommendations to our legislature, to the United States Congress, on what we think it needs to do to improve fiscal sustain sustainability. Um, not specific programs or specific revenues, but more that they need to come up with a plan for how to address this and, and some elements of what that plan would, would look like. Um, it's a message that we, we bring up in the context of um, a lot of our, our work, and it's, you know, we, we're hoping that it gains some traction. There have been some indications that it might be. Um, there are a number of legislative proposals that have come up recently that would establish a, a commission within the legislature to look at our fiscal situation and make recommendations that would ultimately be voted on for the future. So I, I'm not... Uh, Dreaming that our work is the main impetus for that, but hopefully it's, it's had some, some impact. And this is something that we'll continue doing, even if every year we have the same message uh, and, and, and hopefully we'll have some outcome in the future. So thank you. Sorry about the, the slides not working. No, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeff. I think there were very, very important points in what you said, not only importance of uh, translating these technical complex issues around debt and and fiscal sustainability into a, a friendly language uh, that is uh, can reach out to to uh, all of us as common citizens, but also the importance of engaging with Congress, also to take action on some of the findings and the recommendations from Supreme Audit institutions. And uh, there is a lot of interest also uh, within INTOSAI on issues regarding public debt and the working group on public debt um, has also um, engaged uh, with some of the work we have done on the handbook and there will be a forthcoming meeting also in June where some of these issues will be, will be addressed. So thank you. And I would like to invite now uh, Marianne uh, de John Curet, Secretary General of the Court of Audit of Aruba. And Marianne was one of the peer reviewers of the, of the handbook and she shared valuable reflections uh, and insights and comments based on her work as the Supreme Audit Institution, but also her previous role in the Ministry of Finance. So Marianne, I'm going to share the, my screen with your presentation and please, um, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you. Thank you to all and good day. My presentation will focus on the public financial management and the budget cycle of Aruba. Uh, when preparing the budget and when auditing budget credibility, both budget, budget officers and Supreme Audit institutions should have broad knowledge and insight on the complexity and the interrelationship of the country legal system, the budget system and the public financial management in a wider country economic and governance context. With that in mind, the handbook will be very useful for size to access the credibility of budget on a comprehensive and structured manner. As important, it will also be helpful for the budget office in the preparation and the approval of the budget. The advantage of the handbook is that both actors, Supreme Audits Institute and budget officers will know and understand the premises and speaking the same language. For me, the handbook, that's the most important uh, value, is that both sides can understand each other. Let me tell you about country context of Aruba and some relevant factors of country valuation that may affect budget credibility. 
Um, you see in a nice light, Aruba is an uh, island, small island state in the Caribbean with all the complexity and needs of a big country. Since 1986, uh, Aruba, an autonomous country within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, head of state is the Dutch king, represented by the governor. The country is governed by an executive council consisting of eight ministers who are appointed by 21 elected parliaments. The, some statistical data, uh, the population is officially less than 110,000. Aruba has a multicultural population who four languages are spoken. The economy is an open economy and is one of the most tourism dependent economies globally. With tourism, direct and indirect contribution to the GDP and employment estimated at around 90%. And that makes us uh, with a very fragile uh, for external factors, such as inflation, international conflicts, and not to forget climate change as a small island. Uh, Aruba has relations with the Dutch government, IMF, and the other thing, the Article 4. We uh, receive sometimes the European funds, and we are active on the international financial markets. Next sheet, please. Still, Aruba is not able to submit annual accounts and year-end reports for external audits and accountability at the end of each budget cycle. When the budget cycle is not completely in a timely manner, there is a need of parliament for information, transparency, and accountability. Um, telling some risks and weaknesses of the public financial management of Aruba, uh, the budget of the government of Aruba is based and approved for eight ministries. Preparation is centralized by the Department of Finance, and due to the lack backlog in annual accounts, there is insufficient insight of the financial risk of the public entities and their impact on the multi-annual budget and budget projections. With the backlog in annual accounts and the lack of year-end reports created in Aruba a situation where Parliament uses the budget approval stage to get some transparency and accountability by questioning the credibility of the budget. Since 2020, the budget model has been simplified and the budget approval is limited on the economical uh, classification, excluding functional policy-based uh, classification. There is a huge interest and in long parliamentary debates with the whole Council of Ministers and that there is a high pressure to approve the budget on time. And why, you should ask? Well, we have to refinance our debt at the international financial market, and that needs the consent of the Council of Ministers of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. It takes time, good planning, and positive financial ratings for better conditions like interest rates. Aruba has a mixed accounting system. Uh, the budget of the government is legally based on commitment cash basis. On the other hand, the uh, annual account of the public sector recognizes transactions when they occur and record liabilities and access. Due to a lack of ownership and missing lines of defense at the departments, the internal control is weak. No financial audit is done on the annual accounts by the internal accountant because of no accounting and reporting standards in place. Governments are required to submit their financial reports to independent bodies for external audit and accountability at the end of each cycle. SAI Aruba does audit compliance, performance, and the financial risk on the annual accounts. Last audit report on fiscal year 2018 was published on August 2020. Due to COVID-19, the annual accounts 2019 were submitted in November 2023. 
to the Court of Audit of Aruba. It seems that our budget cycle is moving anti-clockwise and Parliament is still missing the urge of accountability. So I would like to leave it still here and uh, maybe for the next round, have a summarize, uh, some, uh, summarize the, the mismatches between the budget preparation and the uh, audit of the annual accounts. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marianne, for the presentation. I think it was great to actually um, see how you apply some of the of the um, uh, concepts that we have in uh, the handbook in chapter three on how to identify some of the budget credibility risks to the specific context of Aruba. Um, um, I think it's also great to have the experience of a small island development, uh, developing states, some of the challenges in terms of the budget process and PFM systems and processes, and also some of the challenges for Supreme Audit institutions in those contexts. So thank you for that. And I would like to turn uh, next to uh, Josephine Mukomba, Executive Office of uh, the Audit uh, Capacity Building Area at AfroSci E. AfroSci E has been supporting Supreme Audit institutions in uh, African uh, countries, in English speaking African countries, in enhancing their capacity to assess PFN systems and processes. So please, Josephine. Thank you so much. Um, I'll share my presentation. Thank you. Yes, so I'll okay. focus on um, how in AfroSci E we have used a tool which we call the PFM, um, it's Public Financial Management Reporting uh, Framework 2 to contribute to enhancing the credibility of budgets. I will have a few examples and some recommendations. I would like to say um, that in the handbook, um, there's also mention of the tool and um, a bit of information about it. And um, I know that some of um, the size under APROSI E, a size of Kenya, Uganda, and Zambia. They've taken part in the previous webinars, and uh, they've also talked about how they've actually used the tool as well. So the tool actually came out initially as a way of trying to, 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 to have a, a whole of government approach on the implementation of SDGs because we realize that um, without a good PFM system, you cannot have progress on the SDGs. And also the slide that I'm showing now, uh, when we looked at the way that we were doing our audits, we realized that um, when we look at the, the cycle, the, our audits were only focusing on you know, the um, certain uh, cycles, like the financial management and self-delivery accounting reporting and oversight, but the issue of budget preparation, budget approval, macroeconomic policy, these were issues that we were not looking at. So that's why we were also doing this. So I'll just show you, it's quite busy. I, I hope you'll be able to, to follow. Um, I, it, I'll just show you a few because we are focusing on, on reporting as well, a few of the dashboards that um, when the size do these audits using the tool, just on the, you know, on the touch of a button, uh, well, after they've in, input the information, they can come up with tools like this. Um, in a way, it looks like, a paper, but it's a quite a very simplified Excel, Excel tool that size can actually use annually to do their audits. And um, as you can see, some of the issues um, that are emphasized in the in, in chapter seven on the reporting, it's the issue of um, the root cause analysis. So after doing the audit of the whole budget cycle, you get to see which part of um, of which which one of these cycles is is the is the weak one, and also what are the root cause analysis for the different weaknesses, 
We also have um, our dashboard where you can have performance by institution and also how the, the issue of SDGs has been integrated into the PFM processes. And also at the bottom here, you see which are the overall risk areas. So it's quite visual so, so that people can really see you know, the, the results um, at a glance. And maybe just to say a bit about the impacts that we have had while, while using the tool, um, after a number of um, our sites reported to their parliaments about um, you know, the, the performance of these PFM cycles, we saw um, that the members of parliament became quite interested in, um, in knowing more about what we are doing and with these two. And because of that, we have had um, engagements. Actually, at the end of last year, we had engagements with the members of, um, of PAC committees in, um, in the SADAC region, Southern Africa, where they wanted to know more how they can use the information that the size are now supplying them because of the use of the tool and how they can be involved in all the different um, uh, processes. So as you can see at the bottom here, under the key overall risk uh, processes, you find that in mostly we find that our oversight um, um, organizations, the parliament, minister of finance, these are the, the weakest in, in, the, in the link. And uh, they have been quite concerned, especially the, the parliament and uh, the root cause analysis that we do is actually been able to, for us to have quite rich reports, which they can actually use when they are doing their deliberation. I would like to quickly talk about um, some of the key issues that um, we can take into account. What we have seen through these audits is that um, auditors in general, they don't have a good understanding of the PFM cycle, especially the budgeting. So I'd like to thank you so much uh, for this handbook because it provides valuable information for the auditors to learn about the budget cycle and what it is they should focus and how they can um, you know, in, in put this together with audits of public debt and how this is effects on the budgets. And um, also they've been able to identify the more risky aspects in this cycle and they've done standalone audits, let's say just on the budget cycle itself. And uh, also they've made a lot of recommendations in relation to the uh, integration and computerization of the government systems. And it's very important, that, like I said, to increase awareness with the stakeholders. And we, we have done this a lot, especially with the parliamentarians, of course, with the executive. And uh, the area which we will need to focus more is with the CSOs. As you can see in the guideline that this is very important to also reach to those kind of stakeholders. I'll stop here for now, thank you. Thank you, uh, Josephine. And um, as Josephine said, there is an example of how this uh, um, assessment methodology and tool has been used. Um, it's included in chapter four of the handbook, but also I think I would like to highlight some of the key points that uh, Josephine mentioned. I think it's important that the tool does this assessment across the public sector, multiple entities and institutions. And actually that allows also to map some of the key stakeholders to engage and follow up on the results as well. And I think it's also important to highlight this engagement with parliaments and uh, public account committees and how um, to share the information in a way that is valuable also for legislators and decision makers and how to engage with these and other constituencies in addressing some of those root causes of uh, constraints in PFN systems. Thank you, Josephine. 
And our next speaker is uh, Archana Sirsat, Deputy Director General of IDI, and she will share some insights on how work on budget credibility connects with ongoing work on SDG auditing, and also uh, speaks to the increasing interest for also Supreme Audit institutions to play a um, more active role in uh, strengthening the performance of uh, PFN systems and processes. So Archana, I will share your um, slide. Um, Thank you very much, Arancha. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I can see that all of you have joined from all over the world. Uh, and uh, many small audit offices in small island developing states that I see here, also mostly in developing contexts. So it's really a pleasure to uh, share some insights with you uh, related to uh, our thoughts at IDI on uh, budget credibility and the impact uh, that audit work can have on budget credibility. And I'm really thankful to UNDESA and to IDT, who we have always partnered with very successfully uh, to invite us to be a part of this and to share these insights. So the first reflection that I have in a way is that um, the budget is such a core process of everything that an SAI does because a government cannot do anything without a budget, be it expenditure, be it revenues. So it sits at the very heart of the audit that SAIs do, because SAIs are auditing in the public sector, and then what do you audit? You audit government expenditure and spending. So for me, it's actually quite a no-brainer that uh, unless there is credibility, uh, or SAIs work towards credibility, they need to do it through all their audit efforts. And as Josephine was mentioning, I think what we generally see is that there are certain areas that SAIs have traditionally emphasized. I think it's also mentioned in the handbook. And then there are certain other areas maybe that need to uh, be looked at. But the SAI universe is very diverse. The mandates are very diverse. And the context and capacity are very diverse. So if SAI's work is to have impact, then I think it's very important for SAIs to look at this strategically and not have something that is one-off, but think about it, about what is a fit-for-purpose solution and what is sustainable in the longer run in terms of any solution that they look for. So all the recommendations that I would make here are more in the context of how do you find sustainable solutions. And for us in IDI, what we have found typically is that when you look at the PFM cycle, the SAI, which is at the end of the cycle, many times gets left out. And that is one thing that contributes to the weaknesses in the SAI, to the lack of capacity in the SAIs. So another thing that I've noticed is that whenever you talk budget or you talk accounts, most of our stakeholders think that it's something to do with numbers. And then it's only a financial audit that you do around it. So even that understanding of how SEIs engage with the budget, not just through financial audits, but also looking at compliance to budget rules and regulations, or looking at the performance of um, related not only to the process of budgeting, but also to the results and impact of those budgets. And linking that back to people and planet in a way, it's not something that, in my experience, is very well understood by many stakeholders. So there is this one kind of a unidimensional understanding of the work that Supreme Audit Institute do. So I think if uh, SAIs are really to, you know, contribute to budget credibility and have impact, there is a need to raise the profile of the work that SAIs do and for SAIs to demonstrate that value, and it's something that we do a lot. Arancha mentioned the work that we've been doing with SDGs, and I think, again, this is linked to increasing the profile of SAIs, that if you look at budget credibility on its own, you will not find many takers. But if you link budget credibility to emerging issues which are trending, like climate action, which is, again, being done in the InterSci community, like sustainable development goals, like technology, like inclusion. These are areas that you pick up. You will get a better, uh, what do you say, um, 
profile on the work that you do and you're better able to position the work that you do. Uh, so that's another thing that I would recommend. Uh, we cannot as SAIs do anything unless we have quality systems in place. I think the handbook talks extensively about uh, the quality of audits and the standards that are used. And Intosci has revised standards that most of you know about. And these standards focus once again, not only on uh, what I would say, not only on again, individual instances, but they focus on system as such. So it's really important for SAIs to understand the system. There are, there are innovations and experimentations that are happening. They're happening at IDI level as well. Leadership and auditors play a very key role. Josephine really emphasized that uh, uh, the you know the need to bring auditors up to board, which again there is a standard on. Uh, what I would like to say.